featuring Test Kitchen chefs Julia Collin Davison, Bridget Lancaster, Becky Hayes, with Adam Reed in the Equipment Corner and Jack Bishop in the Tasting Lab. Discover the secrets of America's foremost food testers and tasters today on America's Test Kitchen. Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget updates a French classic, pot roasted pork loin. Next, Adam reviews knife sets in the equipment corner. Then, Becky shows Chris how to make potatoes boulangere. Finally, Lisa reveals her top pick for a mandolin. That's all right here on America's Test Kitchen. America's Test Kitchen is brought to you by DCS by Fisher & Pico. America's cooks rely on innovation and culinary precision. DCS by Fisher & Pico, offering premium indoor and outdoor kitchen appliances. And by Kohler, inspiring home chefs to create a professional level kitchen with innovative sinks, faucets, and cook centers. Kohler. Diamond crystal salt for the professional chef and those who want to cook like one. From our family to yours, fresh from the field, foxy organic vegetables. Cooking.com, an online retailer for the kitchen enthusiast. If it's not in your kitchen, try ours. Wendy Vineyards, family owned, estate grown, sustainably farmed since 1883. Lee Kum Ki, providing authentic Chinese sauces for the past 125 years. The world is full of great ideas, but sometimes when they come to our shores here in America, they get lost in translation. King Tut, of course, becomes bling. Yoga, which was a spiritual discipline, becomes nothing more than exercise class. And, of course, the Eiffel Tower becomes a clock. Now, one thing that comes from France as well is the cocotte. This was a covered earthenware vessel, which was used for slow cooking. Today, we've translated that into the Dutch oven. We have the pot, but we've lost the technique. So let's go into the kitchen with Bridget to figure out how to make a great en cocotte recipe, French-style roasted pork. Bridget, do you ever wake up wondering why we do what we do here? Every, Every day. Morning. <laughs> so this answers the question. We just got this 10 minutes ago. It's an email. My name is Diana. I'm a fifth grader in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Last January, I participated in my elementary school science fair. The idea for my project came from your show, and I tested whether breathing into a bag of romaine lettuce, remember this quick yes, tip? Yes, I do. Would help it last longer. I won both my <gasps> school science fair as well as the county science fair. Way to go, Diana. Isn't that great? And the name of her exhibit was To Breathe or Not to Breathe. <laughs> She's also literary. I'm pro breathing. <laughs> <laughs> and pro-pork, too. I am very pro-pork, and that's what we're going to make today. Now, this particular dish is actually quite famous in France. Now, I'm going to butcher the name, but it's Inchaud Perigodin. Inchaud Perigodin. Okay. We go. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great dish, and it's a pork loin that they slow cook in cocotte in a covered pot. Put garlic in there, maybe a few vegetables, and they also add in a trotter, a pig's trotter. That's the pig's foot. Now, we're going to do ours a little bit differently because we're working with supermarket pork loin from the United States. Now this is a center cut pork loin, the leanest of the lean. And this is two and a half pounds of pork loin. Now we've bought one with the fat cap attached and that's good because a little bit of fat is better than none. So I've got a tablespoon of unsalted butter just melting here over medium low heat. And I've got six cloves of garlic. I'm just going to slice this very thin. So I'm going to add half of the garlic here right to my butter. Again, it's over medium low. And we're just going to cook this gently for about five to seven minutes until the garlic starts to turn nice and golden. Then after that, we're gonna put this in the fridge for a few minutes to let it cool down before we add it to the pork. All right, Chris, you can see here is our garlic mixture and it's cooled down, so we are ready to proceed. Now I've got the pork loin ready here. What I'm gonna do is butterfly this pork. Now we're gonna do this almost like a business letter. You remember those before email? And about a third of the way up the pork, I'm going to make my first cut. And I want to hold my knife so that it's parallel to the work surface. Now, it's a good idea to start to open up the pork loin as you're working, so you're not working blind here. And we want to stop about a half inch from the other side of the pork. We don't want to cut all the way through. So as we get towards the other side, I'll just start making more shallow cuts. So I'm going to, again, just insert the knife right there where I stopped before. 
working perpendicularly and just gradually peel away that top layer, again, stopping about a half inch from the end. All right? So you've got a piece of plastic. I'm gonna get this into a nice even layer and take the meat pounder and just go over those slightly thicker areas. Don't wanna go crazy here because we want the pork to cook at an even rate. That's enough of that. So this is a tablespoon of table salt and I'm going to apply half of it to the exterior. All right, and the other half goes on the inside. So we just wanna rub this until it starts to get a little bit tacky and that's how we know that we're working that salt into the meat. Now in addition to the salt on the interior, I'm going to also sprinkle over a teaspoon of sugar. It's gonna help with the seasonings and sugar and pork are as natural as you and me. All right, so now we're gonna put this garlic mixture right inside that pork. So the butter and the garlic, that butter's also going to add some nice richness inside the pork. Now we're gonna fold this up like a business letter once again. So there we go. So now we can go ahead and tie this up. I'm gonna use five pieces of twine. And I'll start right in the middle. Traditionally, when you're tying string, oftentimes you'll tie it like this and then it'll start to come loose again while you're trying to make the second one. So if you just take the string and loop it around twice, just like that, it'll hold. So you can go ahead and make your double knot. All right, so I'm just going to add four more strings here, spacing them about an inch apart. All right, so while I'm doing this, there's a tablespoon of vegetable oil here. If you wouldn't mind putting that in the Dutch oven and heating that over medium heat, we want to get it to the point where it starts to smoke. Now, we want to add some of the flavors of Provence. <laughs> Ooh la la. So this is a teaspoon of herbs de Provence. So the odd thing about herbs de Provence is A, they're not grown in Provence. They're grown in North Africa, all over Europe and around the world. And two, there's actually no specific formula except for savory fennel, thyme. Maybe rosemary. Everything grows in Provence. That's <laughs> right. pretty much true. Yeah. So the other thing that we want to add at this point is just a little bit of pepper. Now we're going to start browning the pork roast. I'm going to start it fat cap side down. And we're going to brown that fat cap side and the other two sides. But we're not going to brown the bottom of that because we found the bottom is in contact with the pan the entire time that it cooks. And it was always overcooked. So instead, mm. we're just going to brown the fat cap and the two sides. And that's going to take about five to eight minutes. All right, so this is browned on those three sides. I'm going to take the pork out. You just want to take that away, don't you? No, it's for me. <laughs> It does look good. We're not done with it yet. Okay. So now we're going to start working on the sauce. I'm going to add another tablespoon of oil right in there. And we're going to add one large minced onion. Mmm. And because we really like that kind of tart and sweet apple flavor, it goes well with pork, we're going to add in one Granny Smith apple that we've cut into quarter inch pieces. So we're going to let this cook until the onion is softened and that's going to take about five to seven minutes. All right, so the onions are softened and it's starting to smell really, really good. I'm going to put in the rest of those sliced garlic cloves, so that's about three at this point. And we just want to cook the garlic for about 30 seconds until we start to smell it. Let's deglaze the pan. I've got a third cup of dry white wine and something like a Sauvignon Blanc would work perfect here. That's going to go in, along with a couple of little sprigs of thyme and a bay leaf. We're just going to cook this for about another 30 seconds, really concentrating the wine at this point. So we need to say goodbye to this for a while because we're going to put the pork loin back in, fat cap, side up. Just nestle that all around there. Now, we're going to put this in the oven, but we want to trap that moisture inside. So first, what I want to do is cover the pot with a piece of foil, just like so, and then I'm going to cover it with the lid so it can gently steam. Okay. Now I'm gonna put this in a very, very low oven, 225 degrees, so it doesn't strangle the meat, make it give off too many juices. So we're going to cook that pork loin until the internal temperature registers about 140 degrees. Now that'll take anywhere between 50 to 90 minutes. So for a fat pork loin like that, it's gonna take about 90 minutes, but for a long, skinny pork loin, it would take less time, closer to 50. Meanwhile, I'm gonna go visit Adam Reed in the equipment corner. He's been testing knife sets.
Knife sets, just like cookware sets, tend to be what the manufacturers want to get rid of most. And that's why we don't usually recommend them, but we're back in the equipment corner with Adam Reed to find out whether there's some light at the end of the tunnel in the world of knife sets. Chris, we have kept an open mind this time. We gathered eight different sets of knives because it's an easy way to buy knives. Buy a whole block set from a reputable maker and you should have a great set of knives. Eight different sets here with a wide price range. The lowest was just $97 for eight different knives, all the way up to close to $700 for a set of eight knives. I would be remiss if I did not admit that after years of testing in the test kitchen, all kinds of different knives, we have pretty strong opinions about what knives are necessary. And we've tested all these different categories, so we know the champs in each category. So we assembled what we call the ATK a la carte set. Now the three essential essential knives for any cook, as far as we're concerned, are an 8-inch chef's knife, and this is our favorite. We'll put that right into the block here. Every cook needs a paring knife roughly three, three and a half inches. That goes into the block also. Every cook needs a serrated knife for slicing bread into the block. Remember, these are all of our favorites. Those are these essential, essential knives. They're sort of a second string of knives that are non-essential, but helpful and useful if you have the space and the money. A six inch boning knife is great for trimming silver skin or boning chickens. A 12 inch slicing knife, if you're gonna go after a big roast beef or something like that, that's great to have. We're gonna put that in just like that. And then kitchen shears for cutting the backbone out of a chicken. So these are the a la carte set. For the chef's knives, we chopped onions, we minced parsley, and we broke down whole chickens. For the paring knives, we peeled apples, then we quartered them and cored them. And we're testing how nimble they were, how sharp they were. And basically, all of the chef's knives and paring knives did a pretty okay job. Couple of the chef's knives bruised parsley a little bit as we minced, or crushed onions as we sliced a little bit but not deal breakers at all. It was a different story, however, with some of the serrated knives. Uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. This is where I get a little persnickety. Why don't I have you try slicing some bread while I talk about this? This is a serrated knife that came from this set here. And just slice through the middle of that loaf there. One of the things that we have found with serrated knives is that length really helps get through yeah. a big, crusty loaf like those. And that I mean, was what it, we tested it, It's on. a good knife. It's just not long enough. It's just not right. long enough. I'm going to have you try that second loaf with, this is the identical knife, but 10 inches instead of 8. This is our favorite serrated knife. One sweep right through. Yeah. Much easier. That was one of the problems with the serrated knives in all these sets. They were all too short. They were all 8 inches. Now, something you said in the beginning is an interesting point. While we were researching these, we learned that these sets are really put together based on retailers' needs more than consumers' needs. The retailers want to be able to sell a set with as many pieces as possible for an attractive price. And that's why you get all of these sort of knives that don't make a ton of sense to us. More pieces, better price. Shocking. On the topic of pieces, the block itself and a honing steel, if it comes with the set, also count as pieces. So in the end, if you're really determined to buy a block set, we have a couple of recommendations, but with reservations. This set right here is the Wusthof Classic Deluxe eight-piece block set. Great chef's knife, really good paring knife, a nice slicing knife, kitchen shears, we like that, but the serrated knife was too short for us. Also, it's not cheap, it's $380 for this set. If you want something a little less expensive, this is the Rosewood Victorinox seven piece set. Also did well with the chef's knife and the paring knife. The slicing knife in here is a little bit longer than the Wusthof, and this one is just shy of $190. Our heartiest recommendation, Chris, actually goes to the ATK a la carte set. These are the champs from all of our previous knife testings. This is the Bodum Bistro knife block. That's included in the overall price. And you can put this together for $335. So that's from Adam Reed, the most hated man in the knife set world. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like this guy. So our, with reservations, you could buy the Wusthof Trident at almost $400. The Victorinox was about $190, but we actually recommend you go to our website, americastestkitchentv.com, and we have put together our set of our very favorite knives. It comes with a Bodum block as well. Yes. There you go. All right, Chris, time to take the pork out of the oven. 
Whoa. So we took this out because it's 140 degrees, so now it's time to come out of the pot. All right, so now we're going to tent this with a piece of foil. Let's let the pork rest for about 20 minutes and retain all of its juices. Now, you don't happen to have a trotter anywhere on your body, They're usually do you? in my mouth, <laughs> but uh, you can't have them. I mean, pig trotters are really hard to find, but they do have an amazing amount of gelatin in them, and that's what gives the sauce such great body. Well, we're going to go for a little easier option here, and this is powder gelatin. This is a tablespoon. So I'm just going to sprinkle the gelatin over a quarter cup of chicken broth, and it'll soften. That should only take about five minutes. All right, Chris, let's finish off the sauce, and I'm gonna get rid of these sprigs of thyme and bay leaf. All right, so now I just wanna gather all this beautiful jus. I'm gonna measure it out. So I'm looking for one and a quarter cups of the sauce, and it's not quite there, so I'm gonna add a little bit more chicken broth to measure up one and a quarter cup. There we go. And I'll put that right back into the pot. All right, so if you could turn the heat on to medium, I'm gonna bring this back up to the simmer. All right, so now that this is up to the simmer, we can go ahead and add in that gelatin. Just gonna whisk this in. All right, now we're gonna add a little bit more richness to this sauce. I'm gonna add in a tablespoon of unsalted butter. Mmm, and for a little bit of green at the end, a tablespoon of fresh parsley. We'll just whisk this. The butter really enriches the sauce. So that is our sauce. So it's time to move down to the pork, which has rested. Oh, you can see how moist that meat is. And I'll give you some beautiful sauce. Mm. Oh, yeah. What's the expression, pig heaven? Exactly. Yeah. This is my kind of food, Chris. Oh. oh. Mm. So tender. Mm. Well, it's tender, it's juicy, but also that apple. It's not amazing. There's a little hint of sweet. Yeah. is very, very good. Mm. This is outstanding. So the secrets to French-style pot roasted pork. We took a nice piece of pork loin. We opened it up like a business letter. A little salt, a little sugar, a little garlic, a little butter. Wrapped it back up. Sautéed on three sides, not on the bottom, and into a very low oven for a nice long time and finished off with a simple sauce at the end. So there you have it from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen. A French style pot roasted pork, otherwise known as a show Pellet Goldin. Merci beaucoup. Okay. <laughs> like most old recipes, and I would know, of course, <laughs> Potatoes Boulangere started with a great tradition of roasting meats and then flavoring, usually potatoes as you cook the meat. Actually, you could do that in a fireplace with a dripping pan, throw some potatoes in and get nicely flavored potatoes. Or boulangere means the bakery in town. You might go to church Sunday morning, hand the roast over to the baker, and in the residual heat in the oven, they would actually cook your roast, and then the potatoes would be flavored. So your challenge is to do potatoes boulangere, but we're not cooking a roast. No. You want to get a meaty flavor into the potatoes without the roast. That's so right. There's that's no, way I'm, no way I'm making a roast just for a side dish. So as you can see, I have some bacon going and what better way to add meaty flavor to potatoes than bacon. This is three slices of thick cut bacon and I'm cooking it over medium low heat. So we'll cook this bacon until it's crispy. That'll take 10 to 13 minutes. And we'll pour off all that fat. I just want to use one tablespoon. And we'll need medium heat. So I'll measure back in one tablespoon of bacon fat. You're actually using fat? <laughs> just Becky, a what bit. happened to you? Just a touch. <laughs> And then I have one large onion, halved and sliced thin. And a quarter teaspoon of salt. So we'll cook the onions for about 25 minutes. If they get a little bit too dark, we'll add a tablespoon of water, adjust the heat a little bit, and we want to cook them until they're golden brown. And that's plenty of time to check in with our gadget guru. That's Lisa McManus. Well, Chris, when we want to slice a lot of vegetables fast, we pull out our secret weapon, the mandolin. This is a restaurant tool that you can use at home. With this, you can slice a lot of vegetables in a matter of seconds. And the really important thing is that all the slices will come out exactly the same thickness, which is important when you want them to cook evenly. We have tested a dozen of these, and we like this one the best. It's called the OXO Good Grips Mandolin V-Blade Slicer. It has a V-shaped blade, which helps the vegetables not jam up. It has this really nice, big, wide, sturdy gripper guard to protect your hands from that blade as you're going past it. 
And here's the part we really loved about this one. Other mandolins leave you guessing when the recipe says give me a quarter inch slice. This one lets you set the exact width of slice that you want. The blades lock in this position or you can set it, here I'm going to make it one eighth of an inch. You take the vegetable and you put it right on here and this is it. And look at these slices. You would never do that with a chef's knife in that much time. So that one's $39.99. If that seems to like too much for what you want to do, we have a great alternative. This is a simple paddle style slicer. It's by Kyocera and it's got a ceramic blade. You can get four different slicing thickness by just adjusting this little bar on the back. It's got a little guard for your hand. And you can slice with this either right here on the cutting board but it also has these cool little notches so you can put it over a bowl, which is, I love doing this. When you just want to get through all that zucchini in a few minutes. So you can get this Kyocera ceramic bladed paddle slicer for $22 or the OXO Good Grips V-Blade mandolin slicer for $39.99. So it's been almost 25 minutes. You can see the onions are just about done. We'll give them another minute or so. And okay. while they finish up, we'll work on the potatoes. We're using Yukon Gold potatoes. They're kind of a medium starch potato with really nice buttery flavor. And we're using three pounds. I'm just going to finish up slicing them here. And the easiest, fastest way is to use a mandolin. We want them an eighth of an inch thick because that'll make a nice compact casserole. If they're thick and clunky, the casserole won't quite hold together the way we want it to. We'll put the onions in the bowl along with the potato. And then we're adding two teaspoons of fresh thyme, chopped up, half teaspoon of pepper, and a teaspoon of salt. And then all that bacon that we cooked earlier. So that's going to taste great between the bacon and the onions. Got a whole lot of flavor going on. So back in the pot, I'm going to add one and a quarter cups of beef broth and one and a quarter cups of chicken broth. We found that using straight beef broth just gave the dish kind of a processed flavor. Remember, we're trying to fake a homemade meat stock here. So using equal parts beef and chicken broth makes a really nice, rich tasting casserole. We're gonna bring that broth to a simmer. That'll give the casserole a head start when we put it into the oven to start baking. So I'll just mix up the potatoes and the onions here. Now it's really important not to rinse or soak the potatoes. Sometimes you want to prepare a dish ahead of time and you'll slice the potatoes and soak them in water. You definitely don't want to do that for this dish. We need all of the starch from the potatoes. That's going to help form a nice compact casserole. Just going to grease our baking dish here. And we'll add the potatoes to the dish. Thank you. Looking good already. I didn't want to say, I don't want to like pump your ego, but it was <laughs> looking very good already. I know. Yeah. And easy too, right? And that's Easy too. Okay, there's our potatoes. Now if you want to pour that simmering stock right on top. Now we'll just add a tiny bit of butter. I can't help myself. Just a little bit of butter will help out. That's two tablespoons that I have cut into four pieces. And we'll just put that on top. So we'll put this in a 425 degree oven for 45 to 55 minutes. The potatoes have been out of the oven and it's really important to let them rest for 20 minutes. That allows the starches to reabsorb and the casserole will develop a little bit of creaminess. Let me give you a nice serving here. It has a very meaty roast meat smell. Yeah, it does. It, smells it really does. This is for you. Mm. Oh. Mm. Okay, this is an A. Isn't that yeah, good? Yeah, this is really, really good. Yeah. I mean, I'm not influenced by the fact that it's also simple, of course, but it's, it's delicious. It's really good. So we modernized the French classic potatoes boulangere without the roast. We used some chicken 